So good morning, everyone. Um, again, I'm Pamela Backus with the Corps of Engineers. I am going to get us started and do some of the background information, and then I will uh, follow up with our engineers to describe some of their findings as a part of the study. So this is just an outline. Sorry. Um, an outline of, of what we'll discuss in this presentation, you know, objectives, conditions, evaluation, analysis, proposed improvements, and um, final recommendation. So, okay. So, this all got started through our Planning Assistance of States program, authorized with uh, Section 22 of WERDA. 1974, the purpose to evaluate Lake Beatrice Dam, identify some improvements, um, and determine whether it could hold the storage capacity. So this study took just about two years, um, ran into some access issues in the very beginning, which is what caused a lot of the delay, but we made it through to the end, so that's what matters. So, uh-oh, I'm missing a picture here. Um. Pam, I did email you a hard copy in case Teams was acting up.
So the existing embankment has a, a crest width of about 20 to 35 feet. Now that's, that's pretty robust for this type of a dam. Um, if we were building a dam today, we would probably pick the crest width on order of 12 feet or so, maybe 15. So it's, it's a very, very robust crest width. And they probably built it wide because the dam itself was probably not constructed that well and it probably leaked. So that's just my personal opinion. The embankment height, again, it varies. Some of it tapers down to high ground on that northern reach. But uh, there are sections on that southern reach um, that are up to about 12 feet high. And that's based on our board data. We can kind of see where the stratigraphy changes from uh, embankment material foundation. We start getting that mud uh, Side slopes, again, if we were building a dam today, you see typically you see three one side slopes. And that's Predominantly because we like to have side slopes that you can mow grass on. If you, if you have slopes that are steeper than three to one, it's very difficult to mow grass, you start getting rutting and things like that. Uh, 
the auxiliary spillway, again, I'm going to that out, it's about 80 feet in width. The uh, primary spillway, uh, just a former grist mill. If you don't know what a grist mill is, uh, you must be very young. That's where they used to make grits. My, my, uh, my grandparents actually owned a grist mill in North Carolina, so that's my, my background. Uh, normal storage capacity, 750 acre feet, and it is presently not impounding the water. So an acre foot is um, a foot of water spread over an acre. So you'll see that terminology in some of our reports. Again, the dam was constructed in the mid, <coughs> excuse me, mid 1850s. Uh, auxiliary spillway, uh, just a simple, you know, weir bore type construction, uh, make concrete masonry block, but the deck actually is pretty good. We drove the drill rig over the top of it. But as you can see in the, in the photograph on the right, it's, it's dilapidated, so um, our recommendation would be to remove this structure. It's just it's too far gone. Uh, the grist mill it looks like someone just turned the grist mill into uh, maybe sometime in the 70s, perhaps, or 80s. They, they made it to a, a residential type structure. It's two story, but you can see it in the foundation zone, which is the below grade part. You can see the inner, the inner workings of the old grist mill. You have the, uh, the apartment structures that you would have associated with the grist mill. I don't, I'm not really familiar with those type structures. I just I know I have some relatives, but I don't know grist mill. Uh, so for a subsurface investigation, we drill three boards. Now, for a dam of this size, we would normally drill many more boards, uh, but we always approach uh, geotech bore in a several phase approach. Because oftentimes, what happens is when we're drilling, we discover something that we want to explore more. So this is kind of the focus of our study. It was a preliminary study, so we, we didn't do a tremendous amount of boards, but we did do three, and I think they gave us a really good idea of what we're looking at. So again, we just kind of picked locations that we thought were, were significant. You can see we, we drilled in the old breach area, and that was to try to uh, evaluate the quality of the fill materials placed back into the breach zone. So we also drilled near the canal, which is near the, uh, the primary spillway. And the benefit of that is for a future design, you would certainly want to know what your foundation conditions were like in that because that's going to be a very important concrete structure for the future. And I think we, for some reason, we have another board about the, uh, the auxiliary spillway. So again, there were just uh, three, three boards down to about 50 feet. Um, and uh, the results of our borings indicates what I said earlier. You have, um, you know, a, a dam that was constructed, and you know, we, we get some very loose and soft zones and that just indicates that they didn't have large compaction equipment out there and if you were to impound this dam today unless it had a very wide reservoir which it does it probably see some leakage so for well, what it's doing uh 12 foot high embankment it actually works pretty good so i'm not going to sit here and berate the guys that built it in 1850 i mean for what they were doing um it worked pretty well um, but it, you know, compared to today there are it would be a less uh, robust dam to construct it to a better standard for sure. You wouldn't see these uh, loose zones in the borings for sure. And you wouldn't see these timber fragments, glass fragments, debris, and things like that. Might be worth noting that it held water for over 100 years until, the, until we started putting the raw the sewage treatment plant. That's, that is worth noting. And I'll, also, I'll note one other thing. The dam has failed. We know that the dam has failed on numerous occasions, and we don't we don't know exactly why because it's a reported history. Nobody was out there documenting performance history like we do with, with our dam today. But my suspicion, and that's I, I would say it, but somewhere in the 90 degree survey area, just based on what I know and what I don't know, we suspect that the dam failed because of overtopping, not because it was a was not robust enough in terms of strength. You know, we feel like it overtopped and scoured the downstream slope and just breached the dam in that same spot on numerous occasions. Now, if the dam were to uh, overtop today, the, on the last uh, iteration of repair, the overtop would probably be 
a little bit further to the to the east, which is to the right of the screen. But, uh, yeah, that's breached, but more most likely due to over time is our assessment. Okay, next slide, Lisa. Okay, so here's a, a <coughs> here's a typical cross section. Now again, this is a greatly simplified cross section. You could, we could make a very detailed cross section based on the forms, but there's no point when we, when we do design work, we try to come up with a conservative and very simple uh, cross section to represent sort of the most conservative uh, condition on the dam. This, this is what we came up with. And you could notice the dam is not straight across. It's kind of sunken down a little bit, and that's because the foundation probably was not uh, compacted as, as well as it should have been, perhaps. Um, and that's typical with dams often. You'll see that the dam, the embankment itself, you know, put material on top of something that settles material below. So we have we have two zones in the embankment. Um, we have one that's uh, fairly uh, dense in the upper zone, and that's what happens is uh, when you build an earthen embankment like this, it gets really desiccated in the upper portion of the embankment. And that desiccation uh, it gives it a little bit of strength. It's just a really, really dry soil. If you can imagine digging a hole in your backyard for a, a, a bush, right? You're planting a tree. You're, oh man, this upper foot is really tough. But once you get through it, it's like, wow, it's soft down here. That's because it's desiccated that upper few feet. Same thing with the back when it gets desiccated, it's a little more dense. In that lower zone, though, is where uh, the desiccation really has an influence. Right? And it's just really soft. You get these soft zones, um, blue zones. We group it in values of three. If you're familiar with the geotechnical boring, it's just very, very soft in this material down to the foundation. In the foundation, it was a, a clay sand, and again, you can see it was definitely a transition zone where the electrical material and the foundation were kind of intermixed during placement. Which it suggests that you know it wasn't prepared probably like you would see it today. And then the foundation, of course, just uh, uh, it is a uh, Piedmont uh, silly sand type material. Um, Jason, you go ahead. The next few slides from you, Nathan. Thank you. Uh, again, I'm Chase Lombecchio, hydraulic engineer here in Savannah District. Hopefully, does it sound okay? I'm kind of just yelling into my computer, so hopefully, everyone in the room can, can hear me clearly enough. Yes, we, just, we can hear you fine. You don't need to yell. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I'm going to go uh, next four or five slides and kind of step us through a little bit of what, what we did on the hydrology and hydraulics side of the house. Myself and one other one other gentleman in our group, Dan McGraw. So when you're reading the report, um, multiple of us, uh, engineers H and H and, and geotechnical all work together kind of seamlessly on this one. So I'll start through the methodology here. So uh, the overarching methodology for for the hydrology and hydraulics analysis portion of this was to develop the what we call an inflow design flood as well as frequency storms. So you can think of that kind of as what you would, if we were designing this dam today, what flood would you design that, that crest to? And so that would be, you know, according to what standard you use, whether that's Corps of Engineers standards, whether that's Georgia State Dam standards, and that's all dependent on who owns and operates the dam. Uh, but anyway, so we developed the inflow design flood Frequency storms, so that would be like your two year flood, your five year flood, 10 year flood, 25, 100, et cetera. And then um, we also looked at what we call a PMF, and that is a probable maximum flood. So that would be the largest flood that you can ever imagine could physically happen in a particular location. Um, so once we had all the flood and inflow uh, design set up in using a, a hydrologic model called AGC HMS, we then did uh, all the reservoir storage and yield calculations using AGC Res Sim, and that basically tells us for the size of the bowl or the size of the pond, how much um, yield can we get out of that for, for the downstream um, users during the most 
severe drought. And then uh, lastly, we now that we have a designed bowl, quote unquote, uh, or storage capacity, now we can route that those aforementioned storms through the system using a hydraulic model called AGC RATS. Uh, a couple considerations throughout the entire design process was uh, the original storage goal from Georgia EPD of the 2529, which I think is probably um, maybe an antiquated number at this point, as I know Georgia EPD has been updating their modeling efforts kind of simultaneously as us, so I'm not sure how relevant that 2529 acre feet is anymore. Uh, but with that being said, we also, as you see in parentheses, my, my goal was to maximize the amount of storage that we possibly could in this thing to see what kind of yield we could get with the physical restraints of uh, just the topography and adjacent landowners um, that, are, that are right beside Lake Beatrice. We ultimately ended up with, a, with an inflow design flood of the 1% annual exceedance probability, which is a fancy, fancy statistical way to say the 100 year flood. And that's per Georgia State dams, um, with this being a category two dam, so that they recommend that the inflow design flood is 100 year for that category two dam. The, uh, the dam alignment on top of the dam elevation and surrounding topography is we have, we've actually evaluated uh, two separate alignments which i'll show you in future slides but, but that was dependent on um, again adjacent property and just how high we can really design this thing and then that's kind of the same same note there at the last bullet the reservoir storage is also constricted by the constructability because of adjacent private properties it's a little bit of the the weeds of some of the modeling analysis that we did um, but Ultimately, on my side and in the team side, we wanted to kind of evaluate a couple different locations for construction here. So you see, before you get into the tape, as you see on the right, those two figures, the top, these are two uh, separate kind of alternatives, if you will. The top is what I call the proposed upstream location. So that's, you can see the existing dam in the kind of bottom right of that screen called out in the black box, but essentially we looked at what if we abandon the lower existing dam and just build across high ground, because you already can see the corner. Uh, oh. Can you see my corner? Yeah, you can see it. Okay, okay. Yeah, so by, by placing the, you know, one, one idea or alternative would be building it upstream because it's a much shorter length and easier construction because you already have high ground here and high ground here. Um, the problem is you do lose a little bit of storage and therefore yield that you would gain by building it downstream of the existing. And in this uh, image, you see the existing just for comparison, but in reality, obviously the existing dam would, would be removed and that the new proposed dam would kind of tie in the high ground beside the existing grist mill up to this high ground on the, the northwest. So we modeled these two alternatives, looking at kind of yield amongst the two. Um, there wasn't enough budget, you know, as Nathan said, this is kind of preliminary study here, so we kind of try to do the best we can with the budget that this project had as far as model and design efforts go. Uh, so we used any and all available data, one of which was uh, George EPD developed a unimpaired un inflow data set, which was used, so used that for the, for the period of record to route through. And then um, did a lot of model modeling, and I don't know how, how many people care to know, you know the details of the modeling. I can talk all day on it, but, but basically we routed those flows through this system to try to determine the yield, or in other words, how much, uh, what's the size of the straw that you can put in this reservoir to continue to suck out water during the, the largest drought of record. We looked at that with and without the pumping. Hey, Jason. Uh, the cross system. Sure. I think Jennifer has her hand up before you get too far. She may have a question for you. Oh, okay. Sorry, I can't see because it's taken on my whole screen. I can't see any. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Jennifer. 
Okay, thanks. Just for kind of general understanding, I think in the prior slide, we looked at the cross-section you all developed from the borings. And so your current top of dam is at 306 foot, and your estimated dome pool was 302. So these numbers we're seeing on the slide you're on now, those, I just wanted to understand, those are higher than the current top of dam? This is the, yes, so this is the existing, this is out there today. Right. And what I'm speaking to in these slides is future proposed alternatives. Okay, so this is a newly built, taller than the original. Okay, thank you. Yep. And so by looking at that, we looked at the different elevations at which to build the top of dam. And obviously the higher you build the dam, the more storage you have, the more storage you have, the more yield you get for downstream support from the reservoir, and therefore the more reduction of these flow gaps downstream that you get. So ideally, you know, you want the bigger reservoir, but obviously with constraints. The other thing that you gain with this upstream proposal is you avoid some of the private homeowners here, landowners adjacent to the dam, that you could potentially build this. And again, we didn't have the budget to get too far down the road into the actual design of this, but you could potentially continue to raise this upstream alternative dam height to gain even more storage depending on adjacent landowners upstream. But again, we didn't have the budget. So what we did was looked at both of these proposed alternatives for different varying crest heights of 309, 309 and a half, 310, and 311. I'm not going to go through each of these, but basically as you would expect, with additional storage, you get additional yield downstream. So what we're seeing is, and also this includes pumping, so there was originally in Georgia EPD's proposed initial evaluation, there was a proposed pump. And so we analyzed this using that potential pump with and without the pump available. And so you see the pump actually has quite a bit of impact because it allows for a lot of additional inflow into the system. And Jason, for that, note that the pumping option was looking at the decrease in tributary that kind of comes together downstream of the dam. So the thought was you could transfer water from the tributary to the west and bring it into the storage pool. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Okay, so again, part of the kind of preliminary dam design here is that we need to design, so now we have the inflow design flood or the storm that we're trying to size this reservoir and spillway to, but now we need the spillways for releasing the water downstream. And so this is a bit of an iterative approach here that you need to take to kind of size the spillway, model it, see how it performs, resize it, and so on and so forth. What we landed on was a primary spillway of a square drop inlet with six foot by six foot, so you've got 36 square feet drop inlet that basically combines into two twin 36 inch outfall pipes. And you can see this This was just a schematic we found on the line, so this is not the actual, obviously, the dam itself, but it does a pretty good depiction of what I'm discussing here, which is the primary spillway drop inlet. So you've got your square riser here, water flows over the crest of that, and then drops into these two, the two uh, 36 inch pipes, goes through the embankment out to some outfall pipe um, and further downstream. And then for your extreme floods, we have what's called an emergency spillway or an auxiliary spillway, much longer than what is currently out there today. Um, so through modeling, we figured we need about 600 feet of an uncontrolled broad crested overflow spillway to pass that 100-year event. Um, 
we did a wind wave, a brief wind wave analysis, which is basically if you have a full reservoir, depending on the storage area and the, the acreage of the impoundment, what kind of wind wave runoff can you um, estimate for that location? And here we, we found that it's about 1.3 feet of wind wave. So we need an additional 1.3 feet of freeboard, which um, was included in all these calculations. And we can also include a uh, stop logs for, and this is all in the report, but we included stop logs as well for ease of raising or lowering the pool or maintenance or anything like that. So this is the downstream proposed alignment and elevation. We ended up at a normal pool elevation of 309 feet. 309 feet and ABD 88 with a top of dam at 312. And again, we're kind of constricted at that 312 just because of this. There's adjacent property owners that are right in that 313 um, elevation. And so you can't get a whole, in this location, you can't get a whole lot more than 312 out of that. Uh, the, the dam length for this downstream location is about 3,000 feet, whereas if you move to the upstream location that I showed earlier, you lose about 1,000 feet. So it's less construction cost there, so you only have about 2,000 feet of, of dam length. The height is 15 feet, as I've discussed, spillway 600 feet, and again, the idea would be to hold the pool around 309 and a half feet on a daily basis, which would give you about two and a half feet of additional freeboard to the top of the dam for, for storms and such. Uh, so once we've sized, how we've sized everything, we size the spillways now, we use a different hydraulic model and essentially route those floods downstream of the dam to see what kind of impacts we're getting. And because there's not much impoundment now, the existing versus the proposed are pretty similar and there's really not a whole lot of downstream facilities that are impacted. So you see there's there's some kind of industry right here. I don't even know exactly what it is, but uh, it's on the high ground, so you don't flood there. And there's a little bit of street uh, overtopping of, of roads, a couple of roads, but other than that, there's really not a whole lot of major flooding. And this is what you're looking at. This, this inundation is from the one year, again, the 1% annual chance of seeing this flood, which is the 100 year flood. So you're looking at the, the red is the proposed extents, proposed dam flooding, and the blue would be the current today. If, if you saw a 100-year flood out there today, that would be the blue, and then the red is the, is the after the new dam is built. So again, minimal increase in downstream flooding, or really not, you know, because we've sized both the inlet, the outlet structure, and the auxiliary spillway to pass that flood, that we're really not seeing much increase in additional downstream flooding, which is a good thing. And Jason, is it worth mentioning that, you know, that's kind of the part of the preliminary design where you set the model up, you make the runs. If this were to go to a final design, they would obviously, you know, make some design tweaks so that you don't make flooding, you know, occur downstream. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, even just, as you see, even just with this preliminary, you know, kind of, uh, I don't want to say quick and dirty, but you know, with a limited budget, limited time, this is not, I wouldn't call this a design, but it's kind of a preliminary design, and you're already seeing very minimal impact, so this could be alleviated pretty easily in, a, in an actual design. All right, I think uh, here's one of the Nathan from the last couple slides. Okay, so. Uh if you recall, we have an existing dam. <clears throat> existing dam is about 12 feet high, uh, roughly. And so, if we were to obtain the water that is necessary for uh, to meet the water needs, it need to be raised to about 16 feet. So, uh, obviously, the first uh, option that we could look at is why would you raise the dam? Right? Let's just raise it four feet. Well, uh, embankments are like triangles. And you don't just raise an embankment by adding material at the top because it gets thinner as you go up. So when, you, when you're talking about dam enlargements, you're talking about bringing it up, but not only bringing it up, but enlarging the dam uh, on one side as well. And, and when you do that, 
you don't just throw fill material onto a slope. That's not a really good way to do it. Typically, we like to bench material in. So while that seems simple, it, it, you start getting into these more uh, nuanced uh, conditions that you'd have to achieve. And, <clears throat> and also, we, we have to look at to see, you know, if we fill it higher, would we have any issues? And what we found is that with these loose zones, there's a very good probability that you would have seepage that would just go straight through the dam, right through these uh, uh, looser zones, and, and you would have through seepage exiting onto the downstream slope. Now, some people say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, we actually have some dams in our inventory that we have through seepage coming through the dam that's manifest on the downstream slope. Unfortunately, that's not what we designed for. That's not what we uh, hope for. And if you, if you look at it from a theoretical perspective, it can cause uh, Theoretically, you, you're going to have uh, uh, slope failures, progressive type slope failure on the downstream slope with uh, through seepage condition. So, in terms of uh, an existing dam enlargement, bringing it up and making it wider to accommodate the raids, we felt that was not going to be uh, feasible, uh, not only from uh, a theoretical aspect of can, can retain the water and not have uh, through seepage coming uh, short up on the downstream slope. But just from a pure constructability aspect too, I mean, if you're talking about bringing in a, a lot more material just to accommodate that enlargement, which you've got material there, we felt a better approach would probably be just to take that material, prepare a new foundation, just move it downstream or upstream and create a new dam, uh, a new dam that will have to be longer and wider. <coughs> so we also looked at uh, dam uh, replacement. Again, the rule of replacement is what we, what we landed on from a preliminary uh, uh, review. And when you're looking at a dam replacement, we, we have some uh, typical templates that we would recommend for a dam with this magnitude. And so you typically would see a crest width um, of about 20 feet. Again, side slopes of about 3 to 1 or flatter. And the upper 10 feet, as you transition down, you can bank it a little a little flatter. Often we, we see uh, in the top 15 feet it's 3 to 1 in the lower portions and maybe 4 to 1. And then again, uh, the dam would be approximately uh, 7 foot higher and about 1,400 feet longer than what's existing in the field. Um, and uh, limited, limited free bore. So typically we like to have a little bit of free bore in the boat. If, if you know, if your water storage is here, we like to design the embankment higher, and, and that's called freeboard. <clears throat> and that's to accommodate uh, uncertainties in our model, right? It's, all, it's also to accommodate things like wind runoff, when you have waves that come across the dam. Because once you start having an overtopping, that's when you start having some really issues, some really big issues like you see at the dam currently with these, uh, these bridge areas. So uh, construction costs, uh, just a rough order of magnitude cost um, for construction, our guess would be around 2.5 million. Um, and that's, some of that's based on some recent history of constructing dams, the size. Um, again, there, there's some assumptions in that uh, estimate, of course, about the hazardous materials. And, uh, assuming that we need to get the right borrowed material Good. Let's go ahead and move on to the next slide, Jason. So here's here's what we were proposing. And what you'll see is the dam has three zones. Let me let me point these out. Okay. So this is your dam. This is a typical triangular section. Here's a, a, a sandy material that you see there today. And it's on both sides. And what we're proposing is to have a clay core or a similar seepage mitigation feature. It could be an incline drain with a blanket drain combo, it could be a clay core. But the idea, the concept, and again, this is a conceptual uh, idea. If it would go to a full design, design we have a cheaper way to skin the cat, right? So the idea is that we want to take the phreatic surface and we want to lower it across the dam so that it does not land on the downstream face. And you can see when it comes through the clay, it sort of drops that 
drag a surface through the clay core. If that clay core was not there, you would not have that steep drop down, and you would have the seepage manifest on that downstream, downstream slope, which it's not what we it's not what we designed for. We designed for seepage not to show up on the downstream slope. And so again, this is a conceptual um, design. Probably three or four different iterations of how this could be done. I mean, you could use a cutoff wall. You could use a, a, again incline drains of some sort to, to uh, kind of meet some of these uh, criteria. But this is uh, this is our best uh, standard uh, methodology on what we would expect to see to, to meet that type of uh, embankment. the bun on top of this burger um, just to leave you guys with the final thoughts what I want you guys to take away from this um, you know we evaluated the dam uh, boring showed fiber or timber and stump fragments so there are segments that are satisfactory it's in in decent condition, but there are some areas that need to be repaired just in general, even if it's going to stand as is. Um, but if you're going to put the investment into the dam, then there are some options that you might want to consider upstream versus downstream, um, and whether one of those is constrained by real estate or other, other items. But to put it in the existing Sort of footprint and tying it into that high ground is what we are leaving as the recommendation. Um, as Nathan just said, providing that impermeable core in the center and um, minimal downstream impacts. Um, taking into consideration overtopping might be a possibility given that you have that limited free board. Um, so you'll want to do some, you know evaluations or assessments in that in that avenue. And um, let's see. And then there's some other auxiliary spillway designs that could be considered also. So uh, we have any questions from the room or online? Um, this is Jennifer. I just had a quick question about the risk for overtopping. Would the spillway design potentially be able to address that concern? Yeah, yeah. So essentially, how uh, you would, the designer would get, you know, even further into the weeds here, but, okay. um, but the spillway in, in this instance was designed to pass the, we, we designed both the spillway, which incorporates the primary spillway, which is the drop inlet, and the auxiliary spillway, which is essentially just a low spot in the dam where if it is over top from a huge flood, you kind of force it into a specific area on purpose. Um, and so the, the combination of those two spillways passes, we size them accordingly to pass the, the design flood, which in this case is the 100 year. Um, the design flood, it should be noted that the design flood is dependent on a lot of different things. So it depends on who owns and operates the dam, where the dam is located, um, what what standard is it being held to, whether it's a federal standard or a state standard. Um, so if we were designing this as a federal dam, this would be probably designed to a much larger um, inflow design flood. We would probably be looking at somewhere around a third to a half of the probable maximum flood, which is greater than the 100 year flood. So if this were to be a federal dam built today, which is fairly rare, but it does happen, uh, we would in-house design this to, a, to an even larger standard. But because it's a Georgia safe dam, both under that um, category two, then, then you can design to the 100 year. So that's what we did in this case. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, Jason, I'll make a few comments about it. 
leave one, go back to one of your earlier slides, or that, that was probably fine, but one of the ones with the hydraulic, with, with the current, with the proposed level, that's, a, that's fine right there. For, for context, I want to make a few comments for people in the room who may not be up to speed on the whole project. Um, this is Willow Coochie Creek. Um, and the reason that sounds familiar is because this is Turkey Creek, which runs into Willow Coochie Creek. And then when they run into Bushy and Little Bushy Creek down south, they turn into Willow Coochie River that runs all the way down uh, to here. So um, the, the issues that this dam would be solving are down here, not up there. Um, a couple of comments I'll make about the overtopping. Uh, that dam stood and stood well for a long time until we, I say we, the community of Fitzgerald, put the water treatment plant uh, up half a mile up the road and started putting two million gallons a day in that creek, rain or shine, flood or, or no rain. Um, so the truth is that the dam was not built to handle the excess groundwater that's being pumped into that creek and it overtopped the dam. So the normal flood for 100 years or 150 years didn't affect this until we started putting the excess water in there. And there's no, there hasn't been a study to determine that's what happened, but I'm telling you that the dam stood for 120 years before it got toppled over. So that's not a coincidence. Um, the other thing too, of course, is the entire town of Fitzgerald drains into Turkey Creek. So the more things that got paved in Fitzgerald, the more water that got ran off into that Turkey Creek. And so those two things together have overtopped that dam. But um, honestly, it's probably built pretty well. Um, the, the unique thing about this particular area, if you went east and west of here, uh, for this district, the Alapahal River starts just west of here. This is the Willacoochee River that's starting here, and then just to the east of there is Satilla. So all three of these rivers pretty much start along this same area, and they all go separate directions. Um, matter of fact, the Satilla goes to the Atlantic, and the rest of them go to the Gulf. So um, I just wanted to let you guys know that the that, uh, impairments that we're trying to solve, there are no impairments on this creek, and the main reason why is we're putting all the groundwater in there. But when you get down south in the river, it's where the impairments are, and that's what we're trying to solve with that project. Thank you very much. Scott, can I jump in and ask a couple questions just to help with some context? So I, Nathan or Jason, can you go that shows the two alternative alignments? Did you guys... You know, this is preliminary design, so these are the tough questions that you never want to answer, right? Because <laughs> that this is what clients do. Did you have a preference? If this project was to move forward, do you think the shorter version that's further upstream is better or the longer one? So that's a that's a great question. It's a tough question because I, I think I think we would need we being I guess you or whomever were to work the, the kind of future design on this would need to I think further evaluate how much higher because, because there's a trade off there right so you're going to have with this upstream proposed location you have probably less construction costs because it's a, it's a lot shorter distance you have nice high existing high ground on both sides to tie into the 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 trade-off there is that you're losing the storage area below the dam if you go with this upstream area, or this upstream dam. So you see in this, um, you know, it, it's not tremendous amount. So if you look at the, in this table here, if you can see my mouse, the downstream, this is a measurement of flow for those of you not non-engineers or, or aren't familiar. This is CFS, which is cubic feet per second. That's basically how we measure flow rates. but. Um, so if you had a pump available, uh, this is for an elevation of, you know, what we're proposing 309 and a half, you would get a downstream yield, which is kind of the, you know, the size of the straw that you'd be sucking out for downstream um, benefit of a constant 5.6 CFS with the, with the downstream, with this downstream proposed, because you gain 
additional storage or 5.3 CFS with the upstream. So there is a reduction, and again, I don't have it in the flow in this bottom table. This is this bottom table is only in reference to this bottom, just because I didn't have enough slide room to add a bunch of tables. But but basically, it's a little bit of a I guess it's a it's I think you need to do a little bit further analysis to determine which one would be better because here you're gonna you're gonna gain the benefit of a shorter distance, less construction cost, but you're gonna lose the benefit of the additional storage that's downstream of it. Um, and so there probably needs to be a trade-off analysis, you know, to really determine is it worth the construction cost that you save to build here versus the additional gain of yield that you're gonna that you're gonna have with this downstream location. Right, okay. Jason, can you go to a, a more upstream view? Like one of the previous slides, earlier slides, had, had more of the overall. So the one thing to keep in mind, the issue you're going to have is the infrastructure that's up in here. I mean, that's a, yep. that's a substation, a Georgia Power substation right there, a power substation that would have to be moved. So the cost of of the, of the 312 height starts getting kind of expensive um, if you have to move all, all that infrastructure. But, you know, it's all part of it, right? So, what I, you know, the reason I bring that up is because if you lose this capacity, then, then you'd almost have to be at that height to get any of the, uh, the flow capacity that you're, you're modeling out there. So. Right. I mean, this is probably out of the scope too, Jason, I mean, but did you guys I mean, even look rough a quarter of magnitude of cost. I mean, are you, do you think like the longer dam option is, is this like 50 million, 100 million, 200 million, any, any kind of sense of what the cost might be? For the longer dam, um, the long cost came to 2.5, but it had a ton of contingency, not to being able to describe like quantities necessarily because you're going to pull some of that material from the existing dam in order to go into the new dam. Um, and then like you talked about not discovering any type of hazardous materials um, or you know having a shorter commute to get your other materials in the area. That's also what I was going to note about the upstream locations. You don't have the benefit of, I mean you could still use your existing dam material, which you're going to transport it now, so you've got to add that cost, and that wasn't in there. Um, or if you know, we're not sure how much of that material you can transport, so then you still don't know what your upstream quantities would be out there. Okay, with, with the alignment, with the, like in the bottom figure, benefit there is you've got material that you could potentially just borrow. Mm -hmm. You're not trucking it, you're not moving it. Okay, so you're saying for the, the longer one that would maximize storage, the rough order of magnitude cost was 2.5 million? Yes. Okay. That's what cost us to measure. Anything else? Uh, Jason, can you go back, back to that last slide just for a second? I have a quick question for that. This is actually a business right here. It is on high, fairly high ground, but the, the, that water would come right up to them. Does it not encroach on them in this model? I, I say that's what that. Yeah, correct. Um, the, what you're what you're seeing there is kind of the extent of the. I believe that's the three hundred and twelve foot contour. So I think that's it. That actually, may be even higher. I'm not sure what the contour of that plot is right there, but. Um, but yeah, the current design it does not encroach on those tree um, property. But but it does get into the homeowners a little bit over on the east side. Is that what that is? Oh, only if you if you continue to go. I, I think the homeowner was at three thirteen. And again, so we didn't. The other the other part of this that I, that I meant to caveat is that this is all this was all performed from from lidar, which is satellite. You know, collected imagery. It was one foot lidar, but it was slightly old. I think it was from 2018 or 17 or something. 
but that was the best lighter I could find. So we had one meter, which is three foot, you know, within three feet of, of accuracy. Um, but all that to say, you know, this we, we didn't have the budget to go out and survey a bunch of, you know, that would, the survey alone would have blown the budget on this. So the idea was not to go do a detailed design, but more so just, you know, fairly conceptual with what, you know, what, what can we get out of this. And so, so we use LIDAR for all of this. So, um, you know, keep that in mind that these elevations are not exact because they're you know, collected with with uh, satellite imagery. But yeah, that adjacent land homeowner was, I think, on the ground at 13, 313, 314 elevation. So 312, top of hand, 312, you're fine, um, but it was harder to get much higher than that without impacting them and, and you know, starting to have to purchase land and all that. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, the one thing to know, right, was where this started with the, the modeling that UPD did was that, you know, that's target storage pool would solve half of those gaps that were identified in, the, like you said, that in the downstream portions of, of the region. So, a significant benefit, two and a half million dollars. We understand it's a rough order of magnitude, so it could be more, right? But that's kind of... Yes, the, the, end, the end result of the study. Yeah. Um, I'm sure in the next section we'll talk about the part that got de-scoped from this, which is what would a potential, if this were to move forward to full, you know, design and construction, there would need to be an alternate uh, owner-operator model because, you know, what everyone found out through doing the project is that the landowners are not, um, really interested in selling the land, so they want to keep the land, and that, but I don't think they're interested in, in being responsible for operating and maintaining the dam. So some type of public private partnership or an easement agreement with some, you know, maintaining and operating entity and being involved. But that got de-scoped from this current grant, so now we're kind of shopping around for maybe someone who could help kind of close that part of it out. But, for the engineering work that was done, um, you know, I would have to say I appreciate the core yeah, awesome. and all the great work that you guys did. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions. Well, can we close out this this agenda item? Yeah. Uh, I just like one more follow up with you, Shane, or or whoever, and they might have the answer to this. But um, so preliminarily, when we were getting started on this, you know, I had I had a lot of data in the the study that. Georgia DPD was working on at the time. Um, I got in contact with Wei Zing at Georgia DPD, who's kind of um, the, the hydrologist and the manager of their water supply program from their water protection, watershed protection branch of Georgia DPD. Um, he had told me that they were working on, they kind of abandoned their previous modeling efforts to now focus on a whole new modeling scheme called BEAM, B-E-A-M, which I wasn't awfully familiar with. They were kind of simultaneously working that modeling effort while we were working this modeling effort. Um, so my question is, is, does anybody have an update from Wei or his team on their, their I, I'd be interested to compare, you know, what they've done while we were working on this. Yeah, so those results are actually reflected, Jason, in the updated plan. Um, and we actually had asked Dr. Zane to, to help us maybe do that comparison just to make sure that, you know, the benefits that were originally conceived using the old modeling platform, you know, that they're still a viable, uh, viability to provide those benefits. But I don't know that we've had 